if you want a good advisor for this project, go to her. She's been a delight. She has been absurdly generous to me, so thank you very much. Um, and then also, I'm grateful for Professor Rosengarten and Reverend Lindner for their guidance in our thesis seminar. So thank you all so much. All right, so liberating Job from redemptive summary. Now, this begs some important questions um, before we begin, right? What does liberation mean? And how do we do that with this really old Hebrew text? How do you liberate a text? And then what is redemptive suffering? And why is it so bad? And why does the book of Job need to be liberated from? So I hope I can address some of those questions before I get to the meat. So like it's the best part of the meat of the presentation, I guess. So first I want to address redemptive suffering. And I'm referring to an idea that our suffering has some kind of positive meaning to it. And this has a lot of different shades, right? We have seen a very sort of spiritual religious shade that our suffering unites us to Jesus, it draws us closer to Jesus in an intimate way, or that our suffering sort of remits for our sins and sort of pays back for something we've done wrong. That's a very uh, spiritual way I've, I've at least experienced it. Um, and then we have a way that is a little more popular, sort of the no pain, no gain. Kind of, we suffer so we can get better. And if we don't suffer, we're not going to get better. Um, that kind of uh, is sort of a parody on redemptive suffering, which is that we suffer for something beneficial, something positive. And then there's also a really interesting swipe, interesting shade, where pain reveals God's purpose. So. We suffer so that we and our lives and our vocation can benefit someone else from that suffering. Um, sort of a motorcycle sort of accident survivor will really know how to minister well to other survivors, uh, survivors of the accidents. Um, those are some of the ways I've seen this play itself out. And sometimes redemptive suffering, not necessarily in the ways I've talked about, but some of those ways, sometimes it really works. And it's really an important and essential way of thinking about suffering for particular communities in particular contexts. We have Martin Luther King Jr. who had this sort of infamous um, saying, unearned suffering is redemptive. And that was an essential part of his speech, and it was an essential rallying point around which the African American community um, needed to have. And that was an effective way, you know, a way that redemptive suffering was positive and was um, healthy and good. Um, but sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes redemptive suffering um, really doesn't work out for people who experience suffering. And I've often seen it not work out when uh, the meaning of suffering sort of dismisses or subordinates the human experience and the cost of that suffering. And so in those ways, I've seen redemptive suffering be really harmful. And I think of in particular, we hear a lot about women who are in domestic violence relationships. And they stay in those relationships because to suffer means they're like Jesus. Or their suffering will draw them closer to Jesus. Or if they suffer, um, if they suffer, they can sort of pay back the sin to their husband. Um, and that is a way of seeing redemptive suffering be very bad, be very, very harmful. And I'm interested in a different way of looking at suffering. Um, and as all of our projects have a personal um, I, my own experience of my family, and I have a father who has been diagnosed with early onset dementia for the past five years. And this sort of experience of chronic suffering um, is one in which redemptive suffering is not really helpful, is not really possible. Um, to sort of slowly watch someone you love learn, lose their personhood, um, there's no redemption. Um, and what does that look like? What does that mean? Can suffering and have a different kind of and so that's my personal stake in it. Um, I know whenever we get personal, it's hard to um, be constructive, but I do like that. Um, and so I'm really, I'm looking for another narrative. <laughs> <laughs> I really want to be a Christian, and I really want to suffer with authenticity. I mean, we all suffer in some form. And I'm wondering if there's a different way to suffer that's not redemptive. There's a different way we can think about it that is both in the canon, in our scriptural canon, in our tradition, um, and also true to the lived experience. And so when I'm talking about liberating Job, getting back how do we liberate an ancient text, um, I'm talking about hermeneutics, right? Sort of different lenses that we look at things through. Um, before I came to Divinity School, I had no idea what hermeneutics was, and now I'm using it in my presentation. <laughs> I feel a little 
but it's, <laughs> it's a word and it's a good word. So anyway, I'm talking about a lens that can sort of produce an alternative interpretation um, for individuals experiencing chronic suffering. Because often when people in the Christian tradition at least are suffering, people say, go read Job. It's the book on suffering. It's real good. It'll make you feel better. <laughs> um, I did it, and I hated it. And he asserts that over and over again. 
But then, let's say, but then a little bit later on, by the end of the wisdom dialogues, which are the infamous arguments between Job and his friends, we see the sort of development of a kind of narrative. And Job really latches on to, well, let's see, kind of latches on to this image of a trial, of a trial between him and God, and kind of bringing God to that trial for what is happening. And then the last one we see, so we have the, the wisdom dialogues, they're really, lots of them have a happening. Then there is a wisdom poem, sort of pausing and changing the conversation. And then we have Job represent himself. And there is a very different Job here. His relation to language is really different. In the Roger version of Job, his, the Hebrew is kind of broken. Um, but here in the testimony, it's very direct. It's very comfortable, I guess you could say. And then here we see Job who's saying, who did say, my tradition is it's out the window. It doesn't work anymore. In the testimony, he's like, it works. And I'm, I'm inhabiting it in a new way. But I'm going to inhabit it. So Job is Job has said a lot, right? We have a lot of things he could God could respond to. Roger, trial, testimony. Um, and so, you know, what happens? What does God say? And for those of you who maybe haven't read Job and heard about it, God just God doesn't respond at all. <laughs> Um, and through the lens of redemptive suffering, you could really see that or read that as God subordinating Job's suffering and sort of saying, I am all powerful. You're suffering and it doesn't matter. Um, but I think there's something more true there. And I hope we can unpack that a little bit. And so what God says in the divine speech is it's a very, very poetic part of the Bible. And he has three kind of sections of poetry. And the first one is a lot of um, a lot of imagery about the mystery of the cosmos. You know, this sort of, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst from the womb? These grand questions that Job has no way of answering. And then he moves on to descriptions of earthly creatures. He talks about antelope, he talks about goats, he talks about the ostrich who leaves its eggs to the earth and lets them be warm on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them. It's a very interesting way. And then the last section of the divine speeches is what, um, I don't know if you can see it, is what Michael Fishbane calls a phantasmagoria of cosmic images. And essentially you have two descriptions of creatures, the behemoth and the leviathan. And these are monsters. I mean, the behemoth whose bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs are like bars of iron. Um, the leviathan whose nostrils spew smoke um, when it raises itself up the gods or you have these like wild, wild images. And that is God's response to Job's Roger image of trial. <clears throat> and the way we can think about these crazy images are in a term called poetic ideograms. And that is a way of sort of, it's sort of symbolizing what is happening. And so here, instead of thinking of God in abstract forms like justice and mercy, we see um, the expression of divine wisdom in these attributes of the antelope, in the baby goat. And so divine wisdom both includes how to give birth to a baby goat, as well as this ostrich who's letting her eggs be vulnerable to the crush. Both of those are God, God's expression of God's self. And so our hermeneutics, Fishbane, Michael Fishbane, and Carol Newsom, have a few responses and thoughts about poetic ideograms and what they are doing in response to Job. And Fishbane says, and rightly so, it could be compassion. Compassion is equally about content as it is about timing and readiness. So if someone is ready to hear these things, it could be a form of compassion. If, if Job is ready to receive and be washed over by these images of the creation, perhaps it is an act. And Fishman also says there's definitely a shift of focus happening, that the human is no longer the crown of creation, it is as equal to creation as the raven, as the donkey. And then Newsom offers something intriguing to me. And she talks about this progression as a progression of the moral order, a progression of God expressing God's self. And she says it's, it's a movement from a place of secure boundaries to really, really unstable boundaries with the Leviathan and the Mahimut, boundaries that are at risk. And she says the example of the ostrich, it's an action that was causing death. And that is a strange 
huge moral thing. And she says her argument at the end is that when you know God sort of praises and speaks lavishly of behemoth and Leviathan, it establishes a firm relationship between God and the non-rational and the non-moral. And so what Newton says then is what we see here is not subordination, but a dispute. Because what is in dispute between Job and between God is the very nature of reality and the kind of moral imagination by which those realities can be grasped. And because God is beyond human comprehensibility, God's response to human suffering will always transcend human categories, and it will always be an impact of it. And I think this is an important nuance to bring Kohat in here, because in his Empathic failure is an inevitable part of human relating. It is knit and woven into our human relationships. And here it is the inevitable clash of two necessities. Job is going to be Job. God is going to be God. And when they are responding to each other, they're clashing. And it doesn't mean they have to be subordinated, human to the divine. It just means they're going to fail each other in some way or the other. And so Newsom and Fishbane both talk then about Job's sin, that's part of the argument of the whole book, that he sinned or not, that he deserved his suffering or not. His sin being not an assertion of the will, but a need for order and a need for meaning. And then it's not about Job's conduct, but that the divine speech is sort of an illustration of the tragedy of what it means to be a suffering person, what it means to be. Thank you. 
women's experience of evil and salvation. And what Cabrera is doing is similar work in regards to Jesus' crucifixion. She wants to know how can we interpret its meaning with lenses that are inclusive of a variety of sufferings. Um, her argument, you know, for the feminist that she is, is that um, the cross for the lone suffering male um, does not resemble women's suffering at all. And she argues that women's suffering has historically lacked a role. It has gone unnoticed. The conditions for redemption are just simply not present. And it rarely elicits public sentiment. She argues that it exists in everyday moments and is woven into the fabric of reality. And so because of what she has witnessed, both in her own story and in the community around her, she argues for a reconsideration of the cross as multiple and multiple crosses situated in concrete experience. And in the suffering that is not necessarily redemptive, but changes. And so what she does is she proposes that we put Jesus' cross in dialogue with others. She doesn't want to try and make Jesus' cross less important. She says it's an essential reference for Christian communities, but it needs to be in dialogue with others so that it won't be absolutized and then used by privilege and power. And so she talks about this awesome cross, and unfortunately I couldn't find it anywhere. I almost like, tried to email her, but I didn't want to do that. <laughs> and um, so it's not quite this one, but she talks about this cross used by Latin American women's groups. And it's not this lonely cross on the hill. It's Jesus on the cross, but it's surrounded by people and animals and plants. And the cross is situated in a community that suffers along with it, and that it's not the center, but it's an element of ordinary it's rooted in concrete experience, and it's carried by everyone. And this helps me think about some of the older, more traditional um, Western white male crosses in another way, too, because we still see there are people around the cross who are suffering. And their suffering is also important. And it shouldn't be subordinated by Jesus' suffering. And in fact, I bet you can make an argument that it would be impetus for a spread of Christianity. If they hadn't suffered so deeply, would they have been yeah, ready to do what they did? I wouldn't want to make that argument right now. But their suffering is important. And so, for Cabrera, what multiple crosses means, then, is multiple resurrections. Um, salvation for her is not the sort of far-off goal. She says, we're going to have salvation needs to be accessible by people. It can't be this sort of thing where um, people without privilege toil and suffer and and for her, it's a process of resurrection that takes place in the concrete daily lives. Um, it's a movement that includes a resurrection of um, experience in a cup of coffee, a resurrection experience in finding enough trash to sell to buy a um, experience in flour. And what I love is she says that it's in the resurrection to have hope that you could have hope. So as a way to sort of conclude and draw together both of these things I've thrown at you, um, I just want to read, um, read this for the, kind of the end of my paper. Um, in her book, Rivera writes of a woman who watched her daughter slip into a coma and eventually die. Rivera did not say that the relative privilege of this woman made that loss less legitimate compared to the oppressive rule of the she also did not say that this woman would have felt better if she'd just been able to let go of her daughter, giving her daughter to God to accept God's redemptive purposes for her life. Instead, Gobera said that this is what it means to be human, to want suffering to stop, and to not stop wanting it until relenting comes. And that the relenting was not a submission to God's greater purpose but that it was receiving the changes and the possibilities that came with suffering. And Rivera said this didn't mean despair, that I didn't have to stop wanting my dad to get better, and that even if that desire, that unending desire, changed who I was, I wasn't a crippled soul who refused God. I was human. And so through Gabrera, with you, some in fish vein, I can return to Job and see that the sufferer does not have to bear the burden of making the suffering meaning. In fact, Job assures me it is often resistant to meaning. I also can have hope that empathic failure is inevitable, 
we are free to see that redemption is not the only story we need to fit our pain into, but that instead we can share how we have been changed and experience new possibilities along the way. Thank you so much.